the term actually goes all the way back to the <clears throat> beginning of, of the church. If you look at some of the, uh, just this morning, I was reading uh, some extract from Hippolytus from the earliest part of the third century, 2, 215 AD, and he was talking about the, the holy evangelical and apostolic church. So there's, there's nothing new about the concept. The term was first used by Martin Luther <coughs> to describe the key precepts for Protestantism. So that's kind of where we come into this. So we've talked in this class about the key precepts before. I'll go over them quickly. I won't spend tons of time. But uh, the Reformation was founded basically on, on these premi, premises. All mankind are unregenerate sinners. And we're so rotten that there's nothing we can do on our own to reconcile or justify ourselves to an omnipotent and omnipresent and perfect God. We're, we're so rotten by nature, the day we're born, a little original sin there for you, the day we're born, there's nothing on our own that we can possibly do to be saved. That's number one. Number two, because we're so rotten, we sin, 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 sin. Sin all the time. And it creates this massive and increasingly large gulf between us and that omnipotent, omnipresent, and perfect God. However, there is good news. Through faith in Jesus Christ, humans can become reconciled, or the old word that we don't use as much anymore, justified with God. So even though we can't do it ourselves, God sent His only Son. They called Him Jesus. Anyway, moving on. Uh, God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. Uh, and they sent Him to be a bridge between our unregenerate uh, sinner nature and, and God's perfection. Uh, so salvation for humans is through the grace or unmerited favor of God only because no one is worthy of salvation. We're so rotten that, you know, even if, even if we think we're nice, I'm a nice person. You ever hear somebody say that? I'm a nice person. Well, in, in God's eyes, we're all rotten. So, uh, the only way that God could save us, to save such rotten people, is through grace, or and grace means unmerited favor. We don't deserve the grace from God. But um, God, God grants us that grace if we have faith in, in Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and I should add here, I, I didn't put it in this list, but this is important. Paul mentions it in Ephesians. Even the act of believing in Jesus, the faith part, that's still not something that we do on our own, because if we did it on our own, then that means we would be finding our own path to salvation. According to Ephesians, uh, even the belief in Jesus is a gift from God, i.e., that's one of the ways God gives His grace to us, is that we believe in His Son, and therefore we are, are saved. Uh, and mankind is not saved through works. Works are a result of justification or reconciliation. It's not a cause. So now you, here we have an early indicator flashing red on how this is a very different approach than the social gospel that we're, we hear from the northeastern denominations. So the evangelical viewpoint would be you, uh, God grants you grace to believe in His Son you accept His Son as your Savior, you have faith in His Son, and then you're a new person, you're born again. Oh, there's a loaded word. You become a new creation. There we go. You become a new creation. Uh, and uh, then because you're a new creation, and because you belong to God now, you naturally want to do good things for people. Whereas the social gospel starts from the completely opposite viewpoint, which is, well, that salvation stuff isn't important. The important thing is we be nice people and do things for others. And so you can see already uh, th th there's, th there's, there's going to be a problem between an evangelical viewpoint and a social gospel viewpoint. And there is irony here because all those northeastern denominations, those mainline denominations, were all started by the people who defined evangelicalism, you know, John Calvin and Zwingli and, 
and Menno Simons and, and uh, Martin Luther, and th they have grown away from their roots. So we, have, we have Luther's definition. So uh, if the question you've been asking all your life is, well, can I call myself an evangelical? Well, okay, so we've, we've, we've passed the first definition. If you believe in the basic Lutheran Calvinist doctrine, well, yeah, you can call yourself an evangelical. That, that's what Luther defined being a Protestant was. So 50 years ago, if you were Protestant in this country, that was synonymous with being an evangelical. It meant the same thing. But now 50 years down the line, there's this huge split in Protestantism, and it no longer means the same thing, Protestant and evangelical. Okay, so let's look in modern times. So fast forward 500 years, now we're talking about today, oh, probably going back maybe to the 1940s and, and forward. Uh, and the reason I'm picking the 1940s and forward is because there was a, a young uh, evangelical minister that was starting to become well known at that time, named Billy Graham. And Billy Graham kind of changed uh, <laughs> the, the, the whole world in terms of uh, the word evangelicalism. So today, uh, evangelicals typically put a strong emphasis on the saving grace of God. Jesus is the divine son of God. And they usually talk a lot about end times things, eschatological things. So this is key. So this is the who Jesus was and how are you In many saved. southern denominations and churches, evangelical is synonymous with being born again or having a conversion experience. Uh, to many people, if you say uh, evangelical, then they think that means that uh, you're a follower of Billy Graham. And Billy Graham certainly... Uh, until he got sick, was the most prominent evangelical pastor in the, the country. Mm -hmm. Today that is probably Rick Warren. Uh, but even 10 years ago, Billy Graham was probably the most prominent evangelical Five pastor. Five years, maybe even a little more, 30. Evangelical has also taken on a political connotation, which is not necessarily correct, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but the elections of Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush to the presidency are often attributed in the press to evangelicals. The reason that is not necessarily always true is not all evangelicals are Republican. In a moment I'm going to get into the conservative versus liberal thing, but uh, not politically, theologically. Uh, but uh, a lot of uh, black churches, particularly black Baptist churches, are resoundingly evangelical in their uh, doctrinal view, even though they might be politically yeah. liberal.